I stand before you as an alumni of poverty. So I understand some of the issues that we're talking about. Not all of them, obviously, I'm white. Um, but I do, you know, I feel this very deeply. And I'm really pleased that in my professional life, I've been able to really work to drive systems change to hopefully reduce and potentially eliminate health disparities. There we go. So I work for the Advancing Healthcare Wisconsin Endowment. Um, and you, many of you probably know a little bit about us. Um, we're, we were started in the early 2000s with conversion dollars from the Blue Cross Blue Shield. Um, and we have a sister organization in Madison um, with those dollars. And are really working to invest the best we can in our community. We're a statewide funder. I think a lot of people have the perception that we're only Milwaukee, but I would say probably about half of our community projects are Milwaukee-based. And after about 10 years of funding, the consortium which oversees the funding took a pause and thought, so how are we doing as a funder? Are we really having the impact that we hope that we can? And we felt like we didn't quite get there. There were a lot of great projects, a lot of great programs, a lot of great trainings, a lot of great curriculum. But there were things that didn't happen after the money was gone. The good was gone, right? After the money went away, the program stopped. After the money went away, the training stopped. So that really wasn't good enough. But we looked at the projects that had a lasting impact. And we found that those were systemic. Those were policy changes. And what we wanted to do is to see more of that so that we could get at the structures that are really holding us back. So we decided to focus on policy systems and environments. And I'm really excited to share with you a couple of stories that we have today about some of the impact that we've had. But this is just the beginning. We have a lot of work to do. And I also want to mention that we have a survey so every five years, because of how our funding is structured, we need to do a new five-year plan. So we have a survey on the table outside the doors that we would like you all to fill out today. And um, you just put it in the box there. I also just want to mention that we do have a Behavioral Health Summit coming up June 5th that is also free to attend with many of our projects. So I say that because Mental health issues are really important to us, and we want to share what we're learning about it, but we also want to hear what you all know. So why does this matter? Because it's the structures that really make the outcomes in many ways. We hear about the bright spots, but we also know that so much of the way systems are set up do not help us get to health equity. I'm sure you, there's many different varieties of pictures up there, but making sure people have the supports they need really to thrive is the goal. And when you do systems change, we also find there's sustainability inherent with that, because when you change how people are doing their job, hopefully you change it forever, right? So it's the next person coming in to do that job will do it the different way, the new way, the better way um, going on. So when I think about policy systems environment, one of the first things we ask applicants to help define for us is what is the system that you're talking about? What is it that you want to change? And really define what that is and what are the levers and the problems within it. So we can't solve huge, huge issues, you know, with a lot of this. We have to make changes, you know, to hit those levers and make things happen. <coughs> There's a lot of different ways to go about this. Um, and I want to give you a couple of examples. So before April of 2016, if you called 911 in Milwaukee County and were witnessing a heart attack, you may or may not have received instructions to give CPR. Like, how many of us even knew that, right? I thought everybody got those instructions. So this project went and worked with those local governments in Milwaukee County and the county government to make sure that every dispatcher is either able to give those instructions or transfers your call so you will. So we are doubling the survival rate 
is hopefully what we will see in the data. For anyone who's having a heart attack um, and has a bystander there to help them. So that's certainly a big systems change. It's hopefully applied up equally across the city, across the county. Another project um, that we like to talk about to explain systems change to folks is with a municipal diversion project that is to change police procedure. So the Benedict Center had, had been working with women in street prostitution, and those women are arrested and rearrested and rearrested and rearrested, and nothing comes of it, right? It's just creating the same issues, the same problems with these women. And they were talking with the police department, and the police understand this is not helpful in any way. So what could be done? They brought in the DA's office and started talking about how they could change police procedure so that these women would be diverted. And the police said, yes, that's great. We're very interested in that. But we respond to the community calling us. So we need to make sure that the community understands that we're changing how we're responding to these things. So they did, the Benedict Center had been and continues to do a lot of community outreach to educate community members about what the lives of these women were like. Mental health issues, drug abuse issues, no support, mostly homeless. When the community understood that, they really had a very different reaction. And they didn't want these women arrested. In fact, one of the people is a business owner in that area. And he made most of the phone calls, I shouldn't say most, but he made a lot, frequent flyers, I think what they call. And when he learned what was going on, he really changed his mind about it. And he started calling the street outreach team, but not only that, he actually hired one of the women to work for him. So not only as an endowment did we get some systematic change in police procedure, we also saw cultural change in the community and attitude change. We also receive a lot of applications looking at data, and I know data's been talked about a lot today. Um, and that's a really important piece, so it's important to have data, and as different agencies, it's really important to share that data so things can happen differently. So this example is in Jackson County, which is pretty north of here, and they have the highest young adult suicide rate in Wisconsin. They have all kinds of social service agencies, they've got a clinic and a hospital, police department, but they weren't talking with each other about what they could do to help these kids. And instead, all of their resources are at the crisis point when someone is attempting or complete suicide. That's the wrong place for it, they recognize that, and are working to build that referral system and change how they work with kids and get those early warning signs. So they start slipping in school, they find out the parents are getting divorced, their housing is changing, there's supports that are put in place to help those kids. So we're interested in learning more about your ideas, so please fill out the survey. And think about where to start, which is probably where you are. Um, you know, whether it's in school, the criminal justice system, you know, all of all kinds of different places, definitely you could use some system changes to improve health. We do require multi-sector partners. It's a system isn't one organization, it's multiple organizations, so we want you to bring those partners with you. We do have a requirement of an academic partner, and this one is here today, I believe. Um, and hopefully they bring expertise um, and content, you know, different kinds of skills to your project to help you do well. We also, this isn't advocacy dollars, we want decision makers at the table. So that's a little bit different. So we don't necessarily need permission from the state legislature to do many things. So let's figure out what we can do right now today to make that change so that we can have a more equitable society. We do have some restrictions with our funding to talk to. And there's my email and number. It's also in your packet. Um, and I have this card. So we're very interested in talking to you. Um, please help us in our journey to drive systems change.
thank you for having me. I'm Alex Lazary, Senior Vice President of the Milwaukee Bucks. Um, and I just kind of want to talk to you about some of the things that we're doing um, over at the Bucks and the New Arena Project. Um, not, not probably as directly as you would think related to trying to fix and um, fix the health disparity gap, but a lot of what we're trying to do is really help to try to fix the income inequality gap. And I think as a lot of you know, um, health issues and health disparities aren't just about access and quality of care, but it's also environmental. And so if we're able to you know, maybe help and help bridge that income and quality gap, uh, hopefully uh, we can also then help to bridge that health disparity gap on um, quality and access to care, and then also um, helping maybe with some of the environmental issues. But uh, I'll just start off with a quick little background. Um, so my dad, I'm sure you guys can guess the last name, very similar uh, to the majority owner of the Bucks, uh, it was Mark Lazary. Um, and I came here, and we came here about four years ago. Um, we took over the team, and uh, on my first trip to Milwaukee was was actually in about uh, pretty much four years ago uh, to the date. Uh, and again, it was snowing, uh, so I can't seem to get away from the April snow. But I remember going to my dad and, and being like, hey dad, like, are we sure this is the opportunity that we're looking for and it's snowing in April. Uh, is this something that we, if we really think is the right thing, he looked at me and he was like, you're the one moving out there. I, I don't really understand. <laughs> so, uh, so I came out here. Uh, it's really been, it's been an experience that's really changed my life uh, for the better. Um, I, before I came out here, I had the privilege of working for President Obama in the White House uh, for two years and, and being part of the Affordable Care Act uh, and, and, and working on um, again, trying to bring health care and access to health care to millions of Americans and people who didn't have it before. But since I came out here, I've really been able to have uh, even more of an impact, I think, um, on a local community and a really direct impact. And one of the big things that we looked at and why we thought the Bucks was an incredible opportunity had a lot to do with the development opportunities that we had. Um, and when we looked at, hey, where do we want to put the new arena? Where do we think is going to be the most impactful place to, to put the arena? The Park East Corridor was, was the number one option. And that's because you know, I've lived in New York, Philly, DC. I've never lived in a, and seen in a major metropolitan area where you have 30 acres of downtown real estate with, with no development on it. Uh, it wasn't even like old buildings that you had to take down. There was nothing uh, on it. And when you learn about the history of it, you know, the, I'm sure all of you guys know this, there was the highway that came through that served as a physical segregator of the city uh, and really divided the city um, into, uh, into two separate areas. Tearing that down was supposed to be able to bring the city together. Uh, it was supposed to be able to open it up to more development after 20 years. Nothing had been put there. When we saw this opportunity, we said, this is a way where we can maybe make a difference, where we can help try to create jobs, create development that will not only serve as downtown, but that will help ripple across the city uh, and hopefully lead to more development and more jobs and better paying jobs uh, across the city. So one of the big things that we wanted to make sure that we did was make sure that this was something that could have the stamp that said, this is made in Wisconsin, this is made in Milwaukee. And so we agreed uh, to a partnership with the city where 40% of our workforce would be residential preference program. And for any of you who don't know what that is, that's 40% of the people working on the job site would be people who are underemployed or unemployed for the last five years. And so we were trying to, as a part of our promise for this entire project, we were trying to say, hey, look, we want to create jobs. We want to create jobs in the city. Uh, we want to create jobs in the county and in the surrounding areas, and not just from downtown, but from the hardest hit zip codes uh, across the city. So we also made sure that we did first source hiring uh, in a lot of those zip codes. We did, I think, about eight to ten town halls where we physically went into the communities and said, hey, if you are interested in working on the project, come to these town halls and we are going to bring our general contractor and all our subcontractors. We're going to bring the unions as well. And we're going to make it so that if you're not RPD certified, we were the first ever construction uh, or general project manager to actually RPD certify on site. So we wanted to make this as easy as possible for anyone to be able to work and get on the project. Uh, and then the other big thing that we said that we wanted to do was if you're going to work on the project, we're going to pay a family supporting wage and we're going to pay a living wage because this is something that 
is important uh, to the city. Um, and we kind of believe in that Henry Ford model of try to pay your workers enough so that they can actually enjoy your product. So they can actually be a part of the community and a part of the, uh, the fun and, and the engagement of the Milwaukee Bucks family. And what we have seen is not only have people who have been working on the project been able to come to games uh, and actually be a customer of the Bucks, but you're seeing one of, I think, the safest work sites um, that, that I think we've seen in Milwaukee, and you're seeing a pride of people working on the site that uh, that I don't think you've seen in on a lot of other projects. And you know, I've had with some of the construction people, and what they love is that they can go to their kids or grandkids and you know look at a, a major piece of real estate in Milwaukee and say, you know, I I worked on that, I helped build that. Um, I tried to do a little work on the site where I tried to pour concrete, and after about 20 minutes. I was like, I've got a bunch of meetings to <laughs> run to. I was like, it's, uh, it's, and then like I walk out far enough away, you know, grab my back, and I was like, wow, all right, this is, uh, this is some real work. Um, and and you get a real appreciation, but not only on the on the site where we try and make sure we're being family supporting wages, because construction jobs, while great, are also somewhat temporary. Um, the project will be done at some point. Our our, our development will be done at some point, and you have to continue a steady pace of construction. They're going to have to move to a separate job. So, what we also wanted to make sure was that the people working in the arena, people working across the district, were also going to be paid um, family supporting wages and living wages. So, we agreed to, to a, um, we came to an agreement um, with the Good Jobs Alliance to make sure that we had a fight for 15, so that over the next four or five years, we would eventually get up to. $15 an hour for a lot of people working um, in the arena and outside the arena and in the district, we're actually going above and beyond that. And so the biggest reason that we wanted to do this again was one, try to create customers and try to make sure that we had people who were um, who were able to be a part of the Bucks family. But we also wanted to make sure that we were leading and that we were going to be a leader on this issue and show that not only um, is it kind of the right thing to do to pay people um, a family supporting wage and a living wage, but it's also good economics, and it is good for your bottom line, and you can make sure that you're profitable uh, and more profitable by doing something like this. And what we're starting to see is, you know, we're not going to be the silver bullet for everything that's going on. We're not going to be the silver bullet for any sort of health gap or income inequality gap. But our hope is that we can be part of the solution. Our hope is that we can at least lead and say, hey, look, we're doing something. We're trying to do our part. Uh, and coming up with a solution. Hopefully people will follow and be a part of the conversation with us uh, as we try to you know, make Milwaukee uh, a, a city that, that we all know it can be and we all know that, that it is, which is a top tier city uh, in this country and a place where a lot of people want to live, work, and play. And, you know, and that's our goal and that's why I, you know, it's great to see all the people in the room here and, and everyone here who's looking to make change and who's looking to uh, to help solve some of the inequalities that, that plague this city. Uh, but it can't stop in this room. It really has to be something that after this summit, uh, we're all getting together and, and not just talking, but actually doing uh, and coming forth with action plans and concrete steps to, to really bring forth a, a, a change and, and remarkable change. And so um, I couldn't be proud of the work that we're doing. Um, you know, we're really trying to, again, help try to bridge the inequality gap which we know will lead to uh, to bridging the health uh, the health gap as well because environmental aspects um, are a big part of health disparities and the health gap as well. So um, thank you guys for all that you're doing, um, and I uh, hope you guys see you in some games and hope that everyone's uh, going to be cheering on the bus tonight and we try to force a game seven. So. Great. Director of the Office of Violence Prevention, Reggie Moore, is someone in the building. Um, we, we give shout outs. So, <laughs> you know, thank God, you 
Um, but I am, am very happy to see this gathering and see what uh, 16th Street is doing. Um, I'm glad to be on this panel speaking about the Blueprint for Peace. Now, the Blueprint for Peace, as a document, we in the Office of Violence Prevention refer to it really as a systems change document. And so for us, we look at this as a, a tool of, of public policy advocacy for the people who are engaged, engaged in violence prevention work in the community. Um, this really came uh, after 2015. We had a spike in homicides, and Mayor Barrett uh, uh, had really had to really reassess and, and focus on what the office had uh, been doing and what we were attempting to do at that time. And so the Office of Violence Prevention took a deeper look at neighborhood-based violence uh, and what was driving this uptick that we saw in 2015, which has been the highest in the decade. That year was 145 homicides, 633 people shot by faith. And so while homicide, obviously, we know the end result of the loss of life, we know that many of our communities in the city of Milwaukee are starved emotionally, psychologically, as well as physically um, from the wounds of violence. So as an office, we made a commitment not to just look at violence from the lens of the individual and not to simply look at violence through the lens of crime, but really to look at it as a public health issue. Uh, the planning process for the Blueprint for Peace was funded by the Advancing for a Healthier Wisconsin Endowment at the Medical College of Wisconsin. And one of our pride, proudest achievements with this document, which you have an executive summary in your folders, is that over 1,500 residents were engaged in the city of Milwaukee, 1,000 of which were teens, young people who were either in the schools, after school programs, out of school program settings, or some of them even institutions such as St. Charles or uh, the juvenile reception centers. So we made sure that we ran the gambit to make sure that we had the voice of community residents and not just sector leaders. As it was stated earlier, Gone are the days where you can talk about us without us. And so for us, we wanted to make sure that we elevated the voices of the community as well as those who are on the front lines of the issue, who oftentimes are not always the most resourced people on the project, if they get resources at all. So our definition of violence, there's really three categories that we look at uh, particularly. We start, obviously, with the structural factors that lead to violence, knowing that violence doesn't happen in a vacuum. So we define in our office violence as it is stated in the World Health Organization's definition, the intentional use of physical force or power, threatened or actual, against oneself, another person, or against another group or community, which either results in or has a high likelihood of resulting in the injury, death, psychological harm, maldevelopment, or deprivation. I'm looking at this definition for us who have talked and worked on this issue of violence for so long, it is this lens that forces us to look at structural factors and structural violence as the highest form of violence. So when we're talking about systems change and we're talking about equity, the neighborhoods that this takes place in, the developmental factors that are impacted, when we look at the things that children and families are exposed to, that set the life course trajectory of a young person or their families in a neighborhood. It's something that we really have to focus on where the resources have gone or gone away from to really tell the story and the picture of a neighborhood that's been impacted by violence, as well as the individual. We're not talking about it from the condemning lens of, of the, the justice system, but we are looking at it from the lens of what are the factors that led to someone feeling they needed to use violence to resolve a situation of fear, loss, or anxiety? And was there an alternative in their mind that was reachable and attainable for them? Now, look at my surface profile, I'll try to this. Thank you very much for your patience. Now, the process started in November 16th. Of 2016, we had a steering committee that was over 30 people, uh, some of whom are here present today, and there were hard conversations had there, but we wanted it to be very heavily informed by the community. The Office of Violence Prevention and the Prevention Institute out of Oakland, California, worked to facilitate these meetings. 
There were five steering committee meetings, uh, as well as youth focus groups and several community forums. We, in partnership with the Greater Milwaukee Foundation, um, helped to host the Safe MKE event that pulled together a lot of people, as well as showed best practices from across the country. Uh, representatives from the Casey Foundation were there, Cure Violence, and other folks to talk about things that are going on in other cities that seem to be able to play in the sandbox a little bit better than Milwaukee. But the good news is that there was a lot already taking place in Milwaukee that simply needed support and scaling up. There were six drafts of the blueprint. We went back to the drawing board over and over again with this thing. The biggest point I want to make is that this is a community-led effort as well as a community advocated and designed plan. When you look at the blueprint, um, the four-page document actually is representative of a 96-page document of six goals and over 30 strategies that all have evidence-based uh, supports for them. But these were the things that the residents of the city asked for when we engaged in this process. We um, had a call to action at the Mayor's Ceasefire Sabbath to the faith community, knowing that informal networks in our neighborhoods have a much stronger role to play than they have traditionally played. And oftentimes, when we're holding a meeting at 9 a.m. or when we're doing something uh, to suit bankers' hours, they are not able to participate as fully as they should and as the issue demands. And so what we have is a lopsided system, and we wonder why the community is not engaged. This, we intentionally did our best effort to make sure this was not that. And then we launched it in 2017 in November. And I, you know, there's a lot to avoid politics, I'll say this. It was amazing to see in the room people who were advocates against police brutality in the same room with law enforcement. It was amazing to see in that room elected officials who were on the other side of issues with a lot of community members be in the same room and all of them be in agreement together for stopping violence at the community level and at the system level. And it was, I mean, many people remarked about it, but this was the intention overall. I want to move a little bit faster than these slides. There were four values that comprised the guiding principles of the development of the blueprint. Number one, as I've stated, community being something that was informed by youth and families most impacted by violence. So we had mothers who had lost children to violence involved with this. We had had people who had been incarcerated involved with this. People who had been uh, victims of violence themselves in this process. Equity, that the blueprint recognizes that although violence affects the entire community, that it takes an inequitable toll on specific neighborhoods and populations, including youth, women, and people of color, recognizing that multiple forms of oppression contribute to violence. We could not do this without looking at this through the lens of historical trauma. We talk a lot about trauma nowadays, it's in everybody's grand proposal, you know. But we talk about it from the individual lens and not from the community felt lens or from the historic connection that leads to traumatic incidents that continue and instead of pathologizing just individuals who have suffered. Resilience. We wanted to make sure that we were not just looking at the risk factors that led to violence, but the resilience in neighborhoods impacted by violence. Some of the strongest advocates for the prevention of violence in our city are those people who are working in the trenches in neighborhoods most impacted by it. They're the unsung heroes of this work. There are people all across the city who are engaged in this. I literally came from a meeting right now that we're hosting at the Black Historical Society with over 35 organizers and residents talking about how we can strengthen collaborative efforts to stop violence in the Metcalf Park neighborhood. But all of that oftentimes goes unheard if you turn on the news and get scared about what's going on in Milwaukee. There's far more good than there is bad in the city. There's far more good people working to stop those blood measures that I referenced. Action, this is an action-oriented document. As I stated, it builds on Milwaukee's assets through coordinated strategies that are comprehensive, actionable, and measurable. Now, this was controversial for us in the development of this document. Because the vision, you know, everybody who's been through a strategic planning session knows that vision is where you want to be, but it's not where you are. And if you have not had the hard conversations about where you really are in the moment, 
And some people feel like we can just push through without having that talk. But when we came up with this vision that Milwaukee is a safe and resilient city where the lives of all residents are valued, promoted, and protected, we were very intentional about that in deliberating over that because it means that people are going to have to, to really prioritize differently where we talk about the development of the city that is not just downtown, but also in Midtown. It is also in Metcalf Park, Amani, Sherman Park, Old North Milwaukee, et cetera. All right. Now, we were also very intentional about looking at the intersections of population level, impacts on violence with people, with place, in terms of the physical built environment, and equitable opportunity. And when we look at local investment and schools and, and, and the way that anchor institutions impact a neighborhood, we saw that if there were trends in violence, it largely happened when an anchor institution left the community. You hear a lot of people from older generations talk about when A.L. Smith was still around and how they used to drive past and see the, the frames of the cars. Well, that, that's like a ghost in that neighborhood. But the ghosts of the A.L. Smith factory leaving are still there haunting the neighborhood. And so the impact of poverty on a neighborhood, on the cycle of violence, on the ability of people to have housing in a neighborhood, and everyone's read Matthew Desmond's book, but when you're talking about even strategies like banning the box, banning the box works for employment, but it also works for housing as we see people struggling to make their way and secure homes in neighborhoods that are safe and decent to live in. Now the goals of the blueprint, they really didn't come as any shock. We didn't have to have meetings to, to divide this. But we really had to drill down and see what the strategies and tactics would be in uh, tandem with these goals. So the first goal, obviously, stop the shooting, stop the violence. In the blueprint, we advocate heavily that data is used to equalize the efforts that are happening at the grassroots level. Because data is in the hands of those organizations that are very uh, resourced to have an evaluate, to have those partnerships. Oftentimes, data is not shared with the community most impacted by the condition that it's actually looking at. And so by sharing relevant data to the neighborhood, the neighborhood can actually inform and lead the efforts rather than having those efforts led by those heavily resourced institutions to include law enforcement as well as uh, municipalities. Now, community-based violence interruption and community-led focus deterrence are two key strategies that the blueprint calls for for goal one. Focus deterrence is, is that old school model of everybody from the church meeting with the local dope dealer and saying, we love you, but you gotta stop what you're doing. You gotta stop shooting up the block. And going down to the liquor store corner where everyone's shooting dice and telling them, here's a job application, here's how we feel about what's going on, or occupying public space. A lot of these efforts have been done heavily in partnership with law enforcement, but not necessarily led by the actual communities impacted by it. The same goes for conflict resolution and mediation efforts that are taking place in the community. So even when we talk about mentorship, the, the white collar mentor, we have ways for them to access, but the big homie on the block and stop a shooting from happening does not have an official access point for this work. For us, goal one prioritizes that person. Pardon me for using vernacular and slang, but it's important, all right? So now goal two, promote healing and restorative justice. Community healing has to be culturally relevant. It has to respect the norms of the community that is impacted by it. We have to recognize that violence doesn't always show up in gunfire because a lot of the driving factor for gun violence in our community starts early on as exposure to domestic violence, to child abuse. Just a weekend ago, we lost four women in this city to very horrific homicides. And so the outreach to neighborhoods about the norms regarding violence, starting in the home, starting in families, is major for us. And so when we talk about community trauma, recognizing that it comes not only 
act from an individual lens on the block, but it also starts in the home, and it has to be a door-to-door -door approach that denormalizes violence and that prioritizes subject area experts and lived experience in the messaging of it. Supporting children, youth, and families. We're very strong in the, in the blueprint in terms of advocating for community school. We believe that the community school model leverages a lot of the existing partnerships and resident-led engagement efforts to reduce violence and to offer services and supports to people living in a neighborhood. Also, when we look at um, educating the community regarding workforce opportunities and the links between, as I've mentioned, DVSA and child abuse, we believe that in terms of goal three, supporting children, youth, and families takes the most resources, but it puts the actual outreach efforts in contact with the most impacted by the issue. Promoting economic opportunity, we're big on banning ban the box and those strategies that give a direct pipeline for people who are returning citizens, who are coming home from prison. When you look at Wisconsin being double the national average in the incarceration of black men, you look at a neighborhood like 53206, some of us have seen the movie. I, I take a look at the map of 53206 to remind myself of the complexity of the issue. When you have virtually every household in that uh, zip code with someone who has been impacted with incarceration. What, the, what does that do to a neighborhood? When you take a potential earner, breadwinner, out of a home, out of a family, as well as you take a potential influencer of the lives of those residents in a neighborhood, it leaves a chasm that is very easy to fill with a lot of the negativity that we have seen. Goal five, we uh, advocate heavily for safe corridor, safe passage practices that put people that the community can relate to on the streets so that when the hours of four to six or four to 10, when most incidents might occur, that there is someone to redirect, to reguide, or also to refer to supports and services. And goal six, for us, goal six of strengthening the capacity and coordination of violence prevention efforts. We talk in the office that it's easier to stop somebody from shooting another person than it is to get the people who are paid to work on the issue to work together with. There are many people in this community who obviously work in the nonprofit sector and other forms that come in contact with communities impacted by violence. But oftentimes, the territorial nature and competitive nature for funding prevents the proper collaboration to reduce harm and injury to the people that we're attempting to serve. And it actually creates more problems than it, than, than it solves. Now, my final moments. The criteria for the strategies that I've mentioned are all listed there on your document as well. We wanted to build on that which existed, build up that which didn't exist, and then also make sure that we can advocate for resources to help prevention-focused work that it advanced those assets and that it was rooted in research and evidence-informed practice. So a lot of times you see wonderful things happening in the community, and some things are just evidence-based but not evidence-informed by whatever the clinical definition people are working by. We wanted to elevate and lift that up so that people would make uh, value judgment in terms of where those dollars can go to support on the front end, because you can't just lock everybody up and arrest everybody. All right. Implementation priorities, capacity building and alignment, leadership and oversight, these are the things that we're working towards right now. And the evaluation and metrics are already listed there on your document. I'm going to close out. But you have these maps. <coughs> Refer to them, please. Uh, they bust up a lot of myths about Chicago being one of the most violent cities. Comparatively, you have other cities that are far more violent, but the narrative about cities is critical to look at too, as well as the months that are violent and the trends that we've seen in Milwaukee. Um, the 10 priority neighborhoods are listed there. We did not simply look at them just for aggravated assaults, not fatal shootings and homicides, but within each one of those neighborhoods is a strength that is underfunded, under-resourced, or untapped. And because of that, we are working heavily with stakeholders in those neighborhoods to develop strategies and interventions for those populations, not to be better. And with that, I will take my seat. I thank you all. All right, my name is Ken Taylor. Uh, very happy to be here. 
I'm the executive director of an organization called Kids Forward. We were founded in 1881, so we're 137 years old this year. Uh, we used to be called the Wisconsin Council on Children and Families, so some of you might know us as that. Uh, we have a vision where every child in Wisconsin will thrive, and our tagline, you can't see, is every kid, every family, every community. Really happy to be here with all of you. Particularly happy to be here with a member of my board, Rick Walters, who you saw earlier, and a former member of uh, my board, Joy Tapper, who you'll be hearing from in a little bit. Just quickly, a little bit about us. Uh, we are at home of a number of different projects. Uh, we heard from uh, Dr. Gunn about the Kids Count Project. We're the uh, we're the home of the Kids Count Project here in Wisconsin. And so one of the things about that project is that as troubling as that health data is that Dr. Gunn shared, 28th in the nation, uh, when we break the, that similar data out by race and ethnicity, uh, our ranking falls even lower. So um, when she was saying uh, in Tennessee, uh, they say, you know, thank goodness for Mississippi. Well, when it comes to the well-being of African-American kids in Wisconsin, uh, people in Mississippi say, thank goodness for Wisconsin, because for the first time we're not in last place, they are. So that's part of the challenge that we have as a state, um, and that's one of the things that we work on as a Kids Count Project. We're also home with the Wisconsin Budget Project, uh, works on uh, all sorts of things to do with the, the budget. Um, Race to Equity is a project I'll talk to you about in just a minute, and I'm uh, I'm here with one of my colleagues from the Race to Equity Project, Stephanie Williams, over there. Um, also, we do a lot of work on healthcare uh, and health, uh, and oftentimes uh, we talk about health, and in rooms like this, we do talk about the social determinants of health. Sometimes, most of the time, I don't use that term because it doesn't resonate with the general uh, audience that we're trying to communicate with. But most of what we do uh, would fall into the social determinants of health bucket. Uh, and on healthcare, I'm joined here by uh, a co-worker, William Clark Sutherland, uh, sitting next to Stephanie over there. Um, and then we also work on early learning and education, and all of that is connected to our twin pillars of economic security and racial and ethnic equity. So uh, a few speakers ago, Kim uh, Richard talked about, talked about the, the overstory. Um, and so we absolutely need more people who are uh, pulling the babies out of the river. Um, but what we do, we're, we're some of the folks that, that walk upstream um, and try to figure out what is going on at the systems level. Um, and for us, it's the system that is the over, right? Uh, so for us, it's not a, a big green monster. Um, it's the systems that either inadvertently or sometimes by design cause babies to fall into the proverbial river. So that's what we do. And since I'm a data guy, I can't help but share a couple of data points um, that, and I'm going against some of what Katie said because I am going to share some some bad news. Um, and the reason I do that is to help shape us collectively out of our complacency. Not that the people in this room are complacent because you're you're here because you want to do stuff, but I am reminded that oftentimes, even though we know all this stuff, many people still don't know. Um, so but I would say that when I'm speaking to communities of color, I'm not telling anyone anything that they have lived on a daily basis, but to predominantly white audiences, oftentimes this is stuff that they still don't know, and so we need to talk about it. Oops. Okay, so for those of you in the back who can't see this, uh, this is about child poverty broken out by race. Um, and so you can see that in the United States, there is significant difference uh, in childhood poverty broken out by race. 13% um, of white kids are poor nationally, 37% African-American kids, 31% of Latino kids, 35% uh, Native American, 13% Asian kids. But in Wisconsin, those differences are much wider. And it's a combination of the fact that white kids are less poor than those in the nation as a whole, and kids of color in Wisconsin are significantly poorer than kids in the nation as a whole. So it's a three to one ratio for the gap between whites and black kids nationally in poverty is a five to one 
gap here. We've heard all about the implications for that on the social determinants of health and on health outcomes. So here in Milwaukee, um, the other thing that we know is sometimes we look at poverty um, as a whole, but it's, it's really important to note the difference uh, in rates between kids and adults. Um, and so, and this, this chart um, I created just for this, this presentation, and I learned something really important that I don't really understand, uh, so always in the learning process. And that was that for white kids, the, the rate is relatively similar between white kids and white adults. But for other uh, races and ethnicities, there are significant differences. So uh, we know uh, across the country, kids are poorer than any other segment of our society. And, uh, and here in Milwaukee, that is the case as well. So, so why is that? What contributes to that poverty? There's some other things. Uh, all these things are interconnected. And so here's, a, here's another chart. So this is about unemployment. Um, and so, again, uh, unfortunately, the bad news keeps on coming about the reality of our state. We need to do things differently. We need to act differently to change these dynamics. Highest African American unemployment rate in the nation. So again, second place in Nevada, or second worst place in Nevada, is a thank goodness for Wisconsin. So we're not last. We just heard the data about incarceration rates. Uh, African American male incarceration rate, um, twice the national average. And so when I think about the systems, I think when I look at this chart, I see systems at work. Mm -hmm. Because for me, there's no other explanation as to how possibly Wisconsin could have twice the level of incarceration as the state, as the nation as a whole. And again, second to worst, Oklahoma, then thank goodness for Wisconsin, we're not allowed. It's not just African American uh, male incarceration rate that is worse in the nation. Our Native American male incarceration rate is also worse in the nation, more than twice the national average. We have work to do here in Wisconsin. So, talking about systems change, I'm just going to use so that. That's some pretty dire statistics, right? Um, and I'm not here to depress you. I'm here to talk about the reality, facing our reality. And then what, where do we go from here? What can we do? Because we can, this is not something that's inevitable. This is not the April snowstorm that we have no influence over. The result of these things are things that are made by people, and we can change them. So I'm going to talk about three of the things that we're working on at the systems level to try to make the change that we seek. So the Race Equity Project, um, we put out a report in 2013. Um, and it showed that Dane County, where we were focusing at the time, and we're now trying to expand our work, uh, some of the highest uh, disparities in America, and also that the well-being of African American kids and African American families was lower uh, than other places in the nation, which I think was, was news uh, to many. Uh, again, not news of uh, anyone who lived in disparities. So we've been working at this for some time, and we learned some things that we think might be applicable other places. So we need to have a sense of urgency. Um, you know, kids don't get a second chance of being ready for kindergarten. Um, they can't wait for the next budget cycle uh, to get ready. So we need to we need to have a sense of urgency. But we also have to have a long term commitment. So this data is a product of. 410 years of history in our country. Um, and so we're not gonna uh, work our way out of this in, in one budget cycle. Uh, so we have to be in this for the long haul. Uh, we've heard a lot about uh, community-based work, and I think that the 16th Street is, is great at this, but engaging families and communities uh, that are affected by these disparities and how we, how we don't work bankrupt, how we do that differently. I've never been part of a, an approach that I've been satisfied with our uh, attempts to do that. We have a lot of work to do to learn how to do that well. Our services and systems have to be comprehensive and collaborative. We've been hearing that all day. Um, and we have to have, uh, we, you know, the, the buzzword in my world is a two-generation strategy. Uh, so of course kids are part of families. The fact that we have to 
come up with a term to remind us that um, is an indication of how far away from common sense some of our systems have gotten. Uh, but I'll use it if that's what it takes uh, to make the case. Absolutely, we have that two generation. In fact, it should probably be a three generation strategy uh, in order to address these challenges. So that's some of the, those are some of the things that we've learned through that project. And so, and we've on this panel, we've heard different examples of uh, what we want to do. So it's enhancing employment and earnings, family supporting jobs for everyone. Uh, it's supporting working families so that if you can play the, the dual role of parenting and employee, and you can be uh, be effective at both of those, and assuring set the success of school. So uh, we know that uh, that that they did they did advance that investing in the early years in particular uh, is essential. Another uh, way that we're working on systems. Uh, so this is the product of, a, of a, a group of organizations that we call the Wisconsin Budget for All. And so oftentimes when I'm speaking with folks, policymakers, others, they say, well, you know, you're a kid's advocate, you know, I'm with you, uh, you know, kids are our future, you know, we love them, um, and we should do something about, you know, this poverty thing and this, um, this health problem and the fact that kids aren't ready for school. Um, but we don't have any money. So we're, we're with you, uh, we're, and we'll come up with sort of things that don't cost any money maybe, um, but we're with you. And so, so, I, so a group of us said, well, let's, let's push back on that a little bit, and let's see uh, where there is money. And so I believe, of course, we could always use more, but there, there is money. We're choosing to spend it in different ways. Collectively, all of us, our elected officials and all of us that support them are choosing to spend it in different ways. So, as Dr. Swain said, we need to invest and target our resources. And there are resources that we can do that with. And so this is just one example of that. And so we have, uh, this group came up with looking at two different tax loopholes. So one of them, uh, manufacturers in our state. I'm very supportive of manufacturing, right? It's a, it's a rock solid, uh, even those that have left, uh, important part of our economy and we're a high manufacturing state and we should be proud of that. Manufacturers um, don't pay tax in our state at this point. Virtually none. Um, also, there's a, a recent thing on capital gains. Um, all of these are, are skewed uh, towards those who are the most fortunate amongst us. And if we combine those two things, um, each year that's about $900 million. So what could we do with $900 million to target um, inequities in health. So health, focus on health, focus on education, focus on jobs. We can make a real difference if we chose to spend that money differently than what we are. Third, uh, third effort um, that I'm working with a, a group of organizations uh, on something that we call the End Child Poverty Campaign. Um, and so we were talking earlier about making the moral case. So this is about making the moral case first, um, setting a goal, um, and holding ourselves collectively accountable to that goal. So, oops, those are, those are our partners. Sorry, I didn't realize we were in time delay. So um, the moral case, uh, working with the Wisconsin Council of Teachers of Wisdom, um, the policy case, uh, it's for citizen action, and so, um, people say, oh, again, you know, this is a big problem, wish I could do something, but you know, it's, it's really too big to throw up their hand. Well, this chart, for those of you who can't see, shows uh, the light blue are seniors, the dark blue are kids. Um, seniors used to be the poorest segment of our society. We decided collectively that that was not okay. We invested, and now seniors are the least poor segment of our society. Uh, we made some changes that decreased out of poverty, and then it went back up. So when people say, oh, we'd love to do something, but it's too big, it's too hard, uh, we've done it before. We're choosing not to do it now. And where else has this happened? So this is the chart uh, that shows some work that's been done in England uh, over the same time frame where child poverty in the US held steady. England cut poverty uh, by more than 60%. So the, again, the idea that this is too big, that it can't be done, it's too hard, there isn't enough money, um, I don't believe it's real. 
They chose to do this, um, and it's by, in part, by setting a goal. Uh, so what we're proposing is setting a goal of cutting childhood poverty in half in 10 years in Wisconsin and cutting racial disparities in childhood poverty in half in 10 years. Get it in statute so that we hold ourselves and our elected officials accountable. Evidence-based, evidence-informed strategies to make it happen, and uh, track our progress. So those are things that we think uh, can hopefully change the dynamic uh, from nothing we can do about this, it's a shame, uh, but this is something moral outrage we have to address. So you saw this slide um, before, uh, Maureen showed it, um, and I grew up thinking that equality was the target, right? That's, well, I did, I will say that. Uh, and I've come to understand that that is not uh, the goal. Uh, equity is getting people what they need to succeed, in this case, watching a baseball game. But there's, a, there's another version of this diagram that I like even more. Um, and so the third one shows the fence being different. That's the system, right? So we should do more in order to get individual kids and families the resources they need, in this case, two boxes for the short kid to be able to see the metaphorical baseball game, right? But at the same time, we should be working at the system level to change the system that they don't need the extra box, they can still see the game. Uh, we change the system and they don't need special or additional support to do it. Now, we can't do away with the fence. The fence is there for a reason, it plays a role, but we absolutely can change the fence, and that's what our work is. Uh, thank you.